Okay, great, thank you. So tonight's seminar uh, is sponsored by SFPS Society, Sun Systems, and EDS. We'd like to thank our sponsors, all the uh, co-sponsoring societies, CAS and EDS. We'd like to thank our venue sponsor, Texas Instruments, for providing the fantastic venue in a great location in Silicon Valley. And uh, also for ITC membership and society associate membership, please become a member if you're not a member yet. So we just use your membership fees for the to run the seminar and and all that. The upcoming uh, seminars. We have the part two of our um, uh, time-based search series um, on August 17th by Professor Pawan Hanumulu from UIUC. Uh, September, we're going to have uh, Dr. Rowan, and October, uh, we have a short course, and later, we're going to have another distinguished lecture talk, like tonight's talk, by Professor Bernard Bozer from UC Berkeley. And the one that we just confirmed with Professor Patrick uh, Dier from, uh, uh, he's also an IEEE Associate Distinguished Lecturer, which is going to be on uh, December 7th. Last year's short course, uh, we published a textbook I announced it a couple of times, it's available on Amazon for purchase. It covers a lot of topics on RF and analog. Uh, and next is now um, uh, designed by, professor, by local professors and also uh, experts from industry. And uh, the upcoming short course on October 4th will also be uh, like a, uh, a whole afternoon after 4 p.m. to 9, 9 p.m. short course on RF analog, uh, uh, specifically on frequency synthesizers uh, by uh, uh, Professor Razavi from UCLA. He will cover analog PLO, and Dr. Uh, Shirovsky from um, UC Dublin. Uh, he's an expert in digital PLO. So he's, he's going to cover the um, digital phase lock loops on October 4th. Uh, we are also organizing the, uh, this year's uh, conference, I, I would say, jointly with Computer Society. The date is confirmed on November 15th and, um, and 16th. It's going to be two day. We were planning to have it in the industry, but now we have we confirmed the venue on the Stanford campus uh, with the speakers from industry and academia. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. We're doing recording for the SSCS uh, Distinguished Lecture Webinar Program. And also, please keep your questions to the end of the talk. So um, we're going to have running mics uh, to record the question and also the answer by the speaker. Uh, with that, we get to the tonight's speaker. Uh, we are honored to have uh, Dr. Uh, Vivek Day. He is an Intel Fellow and also IEEE SSCS um, Distinguished Lecturer, and also Director of Startup Technology Research at Intel Labs. Um, tonight's seminar is also part of IEEE SSCS webinar program, uh, for which we're doing recording now. Uh, Dr. Day is an Intel Fellow and Director of Startup Technology Research at Intel Labs. Uh, he is responsible for providing the strategic uh, technical directions uh, for long-term research in future circuit technologies, uh, specifically for energy efficiency. Uh, he has 250 publications and uh, over 200 patents and 26 more patents pending. Uh, he received an Intel Achievement Award for his contribution to an integrated voltage regulator technology and also Best Paper Award at multiple conferences, including 1996 IEEE International Basic Conference, and uh, nominations for Best Paper Award at 2007 IEEE ACM uh, Design Automation Conference and 2008 IEEE ACM um, International Conference on Computer Aided Design, ICT. Uh, one of his publications was recognized in the 2013 IEEE ACM. Uh, that conference as one of the top 10 cited papers in electrical in 50 years of uh, back. He is an IEEE fellow and received his PhD from Bensler Polytechnic Institute, uh, New York. Uh, with that, 
Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Gray. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, today's topic is uh, energy efficient computing in nanoscale CMOS. Uh, as we all know that energy efficiency is uh, one of the most important challenges for all computing platforms uh, going forward uh, as well as recently. And it's not simply about reducing energy consumption or minimizing energy consumption. It's uh, more challenging than that. It's about uh, delivering uncompromising performance, uncompromising user experience while minimizing energy consumption. And that's a much more complex problem than simply reducing energy consumption. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the research directions and challenges in this, on this topic. Uh, the first half deals with uh, dealing with con conventional computing systems, the things we can do at a design level to improve energy efficiency. And then the second half uh, holds in considerations of alternative architectures more inspired by uh, brain or neuromorphic architectures to take the next big leap in energy efficiency for systems that, that are intelligent and autonomous and can serve the cognition workloads much more efficiently than standard computing or machine learning systems. So there are two parts to that and I'll let you know when I switch gear from the one to the other. So we are entering this world of Internet of Everything. Uh, Clearly, we are uh, starting in that direction quite recently, where everything will be smart and connected. That's a new feature of this uh, new world. And it consists of a variety of platforms from end to end. Uh, at the very edge of the IOE, you have wireless sensor nodes of different kinds, which are self-powered sometimes. You have uh, different client platforms, smartphones, laptops, PCs. You have gateways to connect to the edge uh, and the network infrastructure for communications. And then you have the backbone cloud infrastructure for big data processing. And then you have variable devices, implantable devices at the edge. And you also have autonomous devices like drones and robots and self-driving cars. And together, all of these platforms, and they're all smart and connected, they form this world of Internet of Everything. The two things to note about the hardware characteristics or platform characteristics for this kind of a system. First of all, across the board, from end to end, they're extremely energy limited. The supercomputer at the cloud data center, if it's an exascale computer, supercomputer, it has a finite budget of 20 megawatts. It's not a lot for delivering exascale, by the way. It's one nuclear power plant. You can't afford more than that for one supercomputer. So it's still 20 megawatts to deliver 100x more than what the biggest supercomputer can do today. And at the other end, at the extreme the edge, you have devices that are milliwatts and microwatts kind of power, power range. So the energy efficiency requirement scales across by orders of magnitude across the end-to-end -end IoT systems for the different components we have there. The second thing that changes dramatically across these platforms is the size. So on the one hand, at the edge, you have millimeter-scale devices, uh, small sensor nodes that you can deploy in places. And then on the cloud, you have kilometer-scale devices, meaning that computing systems that span entire data center which occupies multiple city blocks, and everything in between. So two things change uh, for this kind of cyber physical systems uh, as you go from one end to the other. Size and energy consumption. So on the high end, the energy consumption is limited by utility power budget or, or cost of energy, uh, especially for data centers and things like that. And at the low end, it's a size that dictates how much energy you can accommodate or store in that platform. So you can't have big batteries for small devices. Sometimes you can't even have space for a battery. So you have to harvest energy from ambient and, and survive at the edge. So for varieties of reasons, uh, everything that's you know, in this kind of systems are going to be extremely energy limited. 
So education is the number one thing that you have to pay attention to for all components, both for compute and communication across the system. And the systems are not special purpose systems. In fact, they're universal, meaning that they should be able to do anything and everything that you need to do for whatever they deployed. Uh, if it's an industrial setting or a retail setting or a self-driving car, they have all these uh, you know, applications that uh, that are not uh, well understood and not even fully cemented yet. So they have to be capable of supporting a variety of emerging applications uh, without re redoing or redesigning the system. So they are sort of need to be universal and scalable. So all the silicon that you build, for, especially for compute, that needs to have the characteristic of being efficient and scalable in size and power and performance across orders of magnitude for this kind of internet of everything system. The second part of the system that's somewhat unique, and that's where the connection to neuromorphic or cognition comes in, is that they are not just computing systems, or they are not just computing and connecting and communicating. They have this close loop interaction with the real world. A real cyber physical system will have at the very front end sensors continuously getting data or sensing information from the physical world in a real time. And that's going to be acquired, encoded, uh, transmitted and processed in context for decision making, cognition, taking action. That action then creates a new uh, set of data to come in in a new way. So there's a close loop interaction in real time uh, at some scale across this end to end cyber physical system. So that's the unique feature that we normally don't have in computing systems of the past. Now, it also needs to have learning. Because there's a feedback from the action, there's a feedback from cognition and decision that is to influence the processing and acquisition of data in a closed loop way that learns over time what's the best way to solve a particular problem or a particular situation. So that's a very unique characteristic which we have not dealt with in any computing system in the past in a significant way. And that's going to create new paradigm shifts in both hardware and software as we start building this kind of IOE systems in the future. Moore's law is going to be the driving force for realizing energy efficiency. There's no doubt about that. Fundamentally because lower cost transistors allow you to integrate more and more components and pores and elements on a chip, uh, which makes it more affordable, smaller size, which is important, we talked about. It makes energy for computing, uh, for, for operation less. And most importantly, it reduces the distance between components, which means, the, which means the cost of data movement much smaller. And you can't realize these benefits with a single technique or single technology um, that doesn't follow more stuff. So it really has to be the foundational driving force for, for taking us incrementally forward to realizing this kind of vision. So recently things have slowed down, as we all know, in more stuff, but there's still a lot left. And uh, people are working real hard to keep scaling at whatever the time scale that's possible and realistic and cost effective uh, to dive forward. Because there's a tremendous incentive from an economic point of view and a power and energy point of view for building systems that can leverage more slow. The second part of it, and I'm going to go through a few uh, elements and characteristics of, uh, of how we design the systems that will have and provide the energy efficiency we need. Uh, one of them is dynamic platform control. We have been doing that in different ways over, over many years, so we have standard computing platforms, but it's going to be even more important uh, going forward. If you look at a SOC or a silicon in package a system platform, it has a variety of components. It has you know, processing cores, it has uh, cache hierarchy on die uh, memory, it has a scalable on die fabric uh, that connects the cores and the cache in a in a scalable and high performance manner. It has uh, graphics and video uh, encode engines, decode engines for client platforms. It has special purpose engines for uh, encryption, for example, image processing for many platforms. It has memory controller to, you know, to connect to the off chip DRAM. It has uh, IO connectivity to PCI Express and other inter input and output parts of the platform. And all of these components are either on a single die or in a multi chip package uh, in a board. And they all have to have these features of being able to 
uh, controls the voltage frequency of different domains independently. Because you're running, running a variety of workloads, they all don't require all the components to be active or operating in the same way all the time. So having independent voltage frequency domains allows, it, allows the flexibility to control the component behavior in a way that matches the workload that's running at this point. You got to allocate power to a particular part of this platform uh, depending on what's running. For example, if a graphics intensive workload is running, you can allocate most of the power budget to the graphics unit and shut down the core and take away power from the logic processing core because that's not doing much at that point. So allocating the power, or reallocating the power budget continuously in a dynamic way, that makes sense for, for that particular workload at that point of time is important. Of course, you have to have DBFS. Uh, dynamic voltage you can be controlled to match the performance and energy requirement of a particular IP block to what's running, and then of course shut down and reactivate different parts of the platform on demand. Uh, because if something is running on something, there's no need to waste power and just shut it off. So that's critical for saving a power wastage. So all of these uh, features must come together uh, to provide, the, at any point of time, provide the best performance and user experience. Uh, subject to minimizing energy consumption and making, making sure you're meeting the constraints of the platform in terms of power delivery as well as thermal. So that's sort of the dynamic platform control feature that we need to have for a variety of these platforms using both hardware as well as software capabilities. And it's going, be, it's going to be more and more important going forward to have more sophisticated platform control features for power management in the future. Now, on the design side, when you design an IP block or a chip for this kind of a platform, you need to have the design uh, be able to operate across a wide voltage frequency range. Because that gives the platform control the most amount of flexibility in being able to run things as they need to, depending on what's running on it in the future. So having a wide range of voltage frequency operation is extremely critical to maximize the benefit of a dynamic platform control feature. And it, it, this includes what we call near special voltage computing or NTV as one point in that range of operation points. So NTV, as many of you may have heard, is, uh, is the point at which the energy consumption per cycle of a CMOS logic is minimized. It's a point of peak energy efficiency of operation uh, for a particular uh, CMOS engine. So as we scale down the voltage, uh, supply voltage, the uh, frequency slows down, uh, the dynamic energy consumption slows down, CV square. Uh, then at beyond a certain point, as you scale the voltage even further, the cycle time increases so much, uh, it typically happens as you approach threshold, that the energy per cycle is actually starts going up instead of going down further. Because the leakage energy starts dominating in terms of the energy consumption per cycle. And the point at which the leakage and switching energy are roughly in balance is where this minimum energy consumption happens. And that's called labeled near threshold voltage because typically that happens around the threshold voltage of the transistor when the voltage approaches the threshold of the transistor. So this NTV computing is extremely important for the most energy efficient point of operation. But of course, we need a wider range above that to span the requirements of high performance and uh, responsiveness and burst performance that we need in many of our platforms. So to understand what does it take to design a complex processor to be able to operate at NTV, uh, we did an exercise in the lab uh, to take the Pentium, the original Pentium core, and redesign that for making it capable of NTV operation. Typically, uh, if you take a regular design, the lower the voltage starts scaling well above the NTV operating point. You have to redesign the whole thing to make sure it works uh, well all the way up to the NTG operating point. Now, in this design, we have uh, the logic core. Uh, it's got 6 million uh, transistors, and it's 2 millimeter square in 30 nanometer CMOS. And uh, we have the on day cache, the level 1 cache, instruction and data cache. That's SRAM cells. And we separated the separated voltage domain of the core and the cache because the SRAM bits typically start scaling at higher voltage. And we did not want the SRAM failure to limit the voltage scaling of the core because core is higher activity, it's higher power, so it's important to scale the core voltage down well below the limit where SRAM can impose a scalability problem in voltage. Now in general, if you design a, a complex SOC for 
near social voltage computing operations, you have to have a divide and conquer approach. It's extremely hard to scale down all circuits on an SOC to extremely low voltage. The overhead for doing that is tremendous, and it actually it's a losing proposition if you want to scale everything to ultra-low voltage by design. So you have to have a divide and conquer approach, meaning that you have to have multiple voltage domains and group your circuits based on the circuit type, the number of the circuits, so that together they can be in a voltage domain by themselves, and they can go to their own minimum operating point, voltage point, without causing failure for other circuits. And whatever other circuits, they can go to you know, their own individual MTV point without limiting something else. Now, the divide and conquer approach allows you to scale the average voltage of the chip very close to MTV, as opposed to taking everything down to the same operating point. And that's a, that's a, uh, that's a approach we really need to adopt for complex designs. Uh, for simple designs, you can design it for operating at MTV very quite easily. But when you have complex blocks, the large SOC, it's not really possible to take everything down to low voltage by design. And also you have to worry about, you know, different parts of the die. The same size circuit can have different NTV operating point, failure point, because of within die variations. You have to have ways to mitigate the effects of within die variations on NTV operating capability across the die by having this independent voltage domain, which you can use as a knob to mitigate the variation issues. So many of the strategies and techniques are really uh, useful for designing a complex uh, processor and SOC uh, that's capable of spanning this wide range of operating voltage and frequency. I'm going to highlight some of the design techniques that we uh, used and we developed for designing this Pentium core uh, uh, to operate in NTV. The first one is that uh, don't use uh, wide gates, meaning that high fanning gate. Use the high fanning gate. The effective I off of the gate is the fanning times the number of transistors in parallel. The I on is just a single transistor or stack transistor. So the I on tie up ratio degrees quite rapidly at low voltage when you have a wide fanning gate and you have failure, functional failure. So we limited our amount of fan in uh, for this design to two fanning per gate, which is the minimum you can have. Otherwise, you have inverter, right? Below that. So two fanning per gate max. Um, and there's a cost for doing that. When you have only two fan-in gates, you're going to have many, many gates in cascade to realize your functionality. So that has an impact on the F max, or maximum frequency of operation. But you have to make this trade off very carefully to span this range and make sure that you still get the NTV operation for this kind of design. The second rule of thumb is don't use tall gates for the same reason. If you have a stacked transistor, many of them in series, then as you reduce the voltage, the ion of the middle transistors, the ones in the series, they degrade much more severely than a single transistor because the VGS, the middle transistor, the source voltage is higher, so that degrades quicker. And there's a body effect in the threshold increase for the middle transistor. Because everything is tied up to be the ground, the body. So uh, for tall stacks, you have a failure earlier as you scale down voltage. Uh, so if you really want to go to low voltage, you should avoid uh, tall stacks in your design. So just two stack uh, transistors are allowed, two, two series transistors in, in connected in for these gates. The second part that people forget is um, typically when you have a multi-voltage design, and some parts of the design are going at, operating at low voltage or NTV, other parts are operating at nominal voltage or some higher voltage, you have to have level translators, voltage level translators between the two parts to convert the voltage from low to high. Now, the level transistor can scale as one voltage goes to very low value. So, look at a strict CBSL or CBSL level transistor. You have the NMOS input, which is being driven by a low voltage. Then you have the higher voltage at the output, which is, which is biasing the PMOS, the cross couple PMOS devices in this level transistor. So, when the input voltage goes low, uh, the NMOS becomes weaker, the input NMOS, but the PMOS remains very strong because so driven by a high voltage at the source. So you have a huge contention from the PMOS, which is very strong, and the NMOS, which is becoming weak, and there's a failure of voltage conversion. So sometimes the individual domains may work perfectly well, but the level translator fails, which you haven't designed properly. So you have to pay attention to that for NTV design. And you need to make sure that while going through this level translation, you don't have a tremendous amount of uh, latency overhead or energy overhead or delay overhead. Uh, so if you 
drive the output of this uh, level translator directly with the cross couple E markers and you size them to drive the output at the same time have minimal contention at NTD, it becomes an impossible problem to solve. You cannot size them for both uh, both of those constraints simultaneously in the optimal way. So you have to separate the output driving from the cross coupled PMOS. So that way you can size the PMOS device in the cross coupled uh, logic in a way that uh, sufficient, uh, provides sufficient robustness at low voltage, and then you size the output driving transistors independently to drive the output at whatever speed you need to drive the output depending on the load. So having the split output CDSL topology was really critical for minimizing the overhead for level transmission across these multiple domains, as well as making sure that when the input voltage goes very low, the NTV, the level transmission doesn't fail. A few other techniques we employed. One was in the that level one cache, uh, even without, even if separating the voltage domain of the core and the cache, the minimum voltage of the regular SRAM transistor, you know, SRAM cell, would have been too high uh, for this particular application, uh, this particular design. So we had a eight transistor cell where you have uh, read, read, you know, read port separated from the write port, uh, and then you have a regular six transistor cross coupled inverter for write uh, operation. But even that wasn't enough. You had to, we had to interrupt the write using the word line signal for write so that there's no contention during write and that allows you to scale to lower voltage. And the, all of this comes with some overhead, as you can realize. There's AD overhead, there's capacitance overhead as you apply these techniques to lower voltage. So you have to carefully balance where you're applying them, how you're applying them, and what's the benefit overall for the whole SOC design as you apply these techniques. For the flip flop, uh, there's an issue at low voltage where uh, the slave latch can write back into the master latch and corrupt the value when the clock gets degraded so that the master and slave are on simultaneously, the transmission gate. So, and this can happen in the presence of parameter variations. When the master becomes weaker, the slave becomes stronger, it can write back into the master. If you simply have a transmission gate in the master and slave latch. So to prevent the write back, at low voltage, in presence of variations, parameter variations, you have to put an inverter, additional inverter between master and slave, so that it cannot be written, the slave can never write back into the master, even if there's a significant overlap of the clock opening and closing. So that was another overhead that you have to pay for the flop designs to make sure they're robust at low voltage. One of the key challenges we faced was uh, in the timing methodology and closure. Now, if you optimize your uh, timing, sizing of transistors and, and timing, at nominal voltage like you normally do, there are several issues that arise when you want to take that design and scale it to low voltage. Uh, first is that uh, if you have a repeater interconnect, you have a repeater, some RC repeater, and you optimize the repeater size and repeater uh, numbers, repeater length of the interconnect to be optimal at nominal voltage, and then you scale the voltage of the design, the repeater transistor delay dominates at low voltage. The interconnect RC delay between the repeaters doesn't change, the distributed RC delay. So you have a suboptimal repeater insertion now at low voltage because the RC delay versus the repeater inverter delay are unbalanced. Uh, they're only balanced at dominant voltage, they remain, become unbalanced at low voltage. So you need to do your repeater optimization considering multiple voltage points of operation, not just simple nominal voltage like you normally do. That was one thing. Second thing is that, uh, the, you know, the presence of random parameter variations. So if you take a chain, a critical path, a chain of gates, and you apply random parameter variations to the, to the, to those transistors in the chain, uh, they nicely average out at nominal voltage. The delay is linearly dependent roughly on parameter variation. So all the random delay shifts uh, since they're random across the edges, they're nice to average out. So you get overall delay change of the critical path is not as bad as the individual gate delay change. Now that's no longer true at low voltage. At low voltage, the delay is exponentially dependent or very non-linearly dependent on parameter variation, VT variation or other variations. So there's no longer a nice averaging of delays across these uh, gates. Because any shift in the you know, parameter is a non-linear change in delay, one of them can become a choke point. One of those gates can become a choke point in the cascade of gates in the critical path and, and be a limiter for critical path. Now, 
to account for that properly, you have to really do this, apply the parameter variations and timing uh, uh, analysis at low voltage with all this nonlinear dependencies of delay on variation so that you can size your transistors, optimize your critical paths properly at low voltage. So that's, a, that's another big part of the methodology that we have to uh, redo or develop to make sure that we are optimizing the timing in a way that meets the criteria for low voltage operation. The last one was very problematic, min delay race conditions. So typically min delay race means it's a failure. You cannot recover the part. It's not a matter of slowing down. There's a functional failure with the yield problem at low voltage. At low voltage, two things happen. One is that your clock edges become uh, slower, uh, more high, have higher slope. As a result, the whole time of the switch plot becomes worse at low voltage. And the impact of variation and clock skew is amplified exponentially at low voltage. The same variations can create a larger skew in the clock distribution tree. So both of those conspire to have more mean delay failures at low voltage than you would observe at nominal voltage. And you have to account for that in your mean delay uh, failure closure, failure analysis for uh, this design. So, so a variety of things to come together you know, to really uh, make sure that you're designing this complex SOC or complex core in a way that's going to be uh, good for this wide range of operations. Now, at the end of that, you know, just to showcase how good it was in terms of power, we said, okay, we run the Pentium core powered by a solar cell. Indoor cable lamp, one solar cell, can power the entire Pentium core. You can boot Windows, boot Linux, run all the applications at you know, reasonable speed. And, and that worked. So it was really low power, really operating at low voltage, and the power was so low that we didn't need a power supply to power the chip. It was all done from an energy harvested uh, solar cell uh, from an indoor cable lamp. Now, to see how low the power was, if you look at the power performance measurements, you find that uh, it operates from uh, 2 milliwatts at 280 millivolts voltage to about uh, 800 milliwatts at 1.2 volts Vmax. And the performance scales from over the gigahertz at uh, Vmax to you know, 3 megahertz at the minimum voltage. So that's pretty wide range, and the both power and performance, you know, the scale by order, you know, is 10x, right, going from across across this regime from end to end. One thing, it's a part of the entire processor. Power for the whole processor. Three milliwatts for the entire, two milliwatts entire Pentium core, running, you know, some application. That's uh, the low end. Uh, now, uh, one thing to notice is that the memory, the SRAM cache, or the register file cache, with it, so that scales at 0.55 volts in spite of having this interrupt in the ride and all of that. So if you had the same voltage domain for both the cache and the core, then you have to start everything at 0.55. You could not have scaled the, the power hungry core part of it all the way to 0.28. Now, 0.28 is really low voltage. And I don't expect so this is one chip, a typical chip in the lab. If you measure millions of these chips, there will be many chips which will not work at 0.28 volts. So, so you have to remember the high volume manufacturing side of it, where now, even the few chips will be scaling on the point to eight, there will be many, many chips they will not, and you have to worry about the distribution of the NTV point across millions of chips to really decide what what is the right uh, operating voltage for this ensemble of chips. But it was a pretty good uh, range of operation, pretty wide, and we are able to get to, I'll show well below NTV in this case, in terms of operation. So look at the power components. Um, at one point, you're super threshold. At point two eight, you're sub threshold. And the near threshold point happens at point four five volts in this case. So if you look at the sub threshold point two eight volt operation, 90% of the power is leakage. Energy is leakage. It's memory leakage and logic leakage, mostly memory leakage. If you look at 1.2 volts, super threshold, 90% is switching energy. Now, the near threshold, 0.45, but energy is going to be minimum, I'm going to show later, they are roughly in balance. Your leakage energy is 40%, switching energy is 60%. So, when the leakage and switching energy is roughly in balance, is, is when this minimum energy point occurs, this NTV point occurs, as you can see from this breakdown. If you look at the range here, as you scale voltage and frequency, the, uh, the, the green curve shows the dynamic energy goes down, and, it, and the leakage energy starts going up in the blue curve, and when the roughly in balance on 0.45, you get the NTV operating point. And the energy there is about 5x smaller than 
the maximum energy at 1.2 volts, highest voltage. And the speed at that point is about 10x lower. So you're operating at 90 megahertz at NTV versus 900 megahertz at 1.2. Now, how do you use this capability? If you have a design that has a wide range, as in performance and power, uh, use it in, separate, in different ways for dynamic platform for dynamic platform control. Number one, if you're going to be running something that needs fast performance, fast responsiveness, a burst mode trigger response, you run it at 1.2 volts as fast as possible, and you spend the energy required for doing that. Sometimes uh, it's Better to run something at very fast, at the highest energy point, uh, to finish something as quickly as possible, and then shut down. Because if you run it at lower voltage, lower frequency, you will consume probably more power because of energy, because you're consuming for a longer time, the lower amount of energy. But, you know, depending on the workload, it's sometimes better to run something really fast and shut down before the next thing comes and wake up to service it again. So having this high frequency, high voltage capability is not just important for getting performance. It's often important for getting just energy efficiency for some workloads. So running fast and shutting down is sometimes a lot better than running slow for a long time. Do you have a question? So, yeah, so the reason we have, the reason I'm going to convince the energy per cycle is the right metric. So, talk about the energy to do something. Do something, you have to finish all the operations. And it takes as many, you know, any number of cycles to finish all the operations. The cycle time is not important. You have to still do as many operations. So, the energy per cycle is energy per cycle is the energy time number of operations. So, the cycle time is separate with the speed, how fast you finish it. But energy you consume, simply depends on energy per cycle because you have to have n cycles to finish all the operations. It's not energy per time, energy per clock cycle. So, so if you look at the energy consumed for doing something, so that's the metric we use because you have, you know, that's energy is the metric. So, so if you have that, then this thing happens. For power, it would not happen. The power is a different metric. It's a, it's for thermal and power delivery. It's not energy consumed for doing something, right? So, Okay, so first one is that, you know, it's race to halt, as we call it. Sometimes you finish something fast and shut down, that's better than running something slow. That's the first thing. And platform control can figure that out, depending on what's going on. Second thing is you want to run something really slow. It's not performance critical. And if the speed that you need is at or below the NTV point, then you run it at NTV, and then you shut down. Because so you have time after even running at NTV to, you know, the work, to finish the work and then wait for the next thing. And then anywhere in between, if you need to run something somewhere in between, you can fix that, right? And, and the platform control will figure that out on the fly, uh, depending on what's running and what's needed. Sometimes you cannot shut down because uh, you cannot wake up fast enough. So you don't know when the next thing is coming. So I, I'm not going to shut down because I don't know when the next thing is coming. I can't afford to let things wait when it comes. So I need to be alive, not shut down, just sitting idle waiting for the next thing. Sometimes there are situations like that. So in those cases, you can park, because it's parking mode, you can park in the NTV state, because while waiting for something, you can be in the minimum energy state. So you're just simply waiting for something, because you cannot afford to shut down. So NTV state offers you this parking feature that, that you can sometimes utilize when you cannot shut down and wake up just in time. And finally, for, you know, throughput limited applications, or fixed throughput applications, where you care about the overall parallel throughput, not a single thread or single uh, block performance, you can use NTV to parallelize. So instead of using one IP or one core running at high frequency, you do multiple cores, each running at NTV to meet the throughput requirement. So your performance is okay, but you maximize energy efficiency. So each of the cores are running at maximum efficiency point. So you can leverage these features of the design in many, many ways uh, for both parallel and serial workloads for a variety of situations. Yeah. Because when you run it at fast, so when you're running in energy efficiency point, you're continuously running for some time, 
and it's dissipating leakage energy. It's reducing switching energy, but the rupture imbalance is leakage energy, so you get, get some energy consumption over that time. Imagine at the same time, you finish something, that thing, in one hundredth of the time, quickly. Then you went to zero leakage for 19, you know, remaining 99% of the time. So you spent more energy doing it, but in a very short time you spent the energy, but you reduce the leakage to zero for the rest of the time. So, be, so depending on how these numbers work out, the time that you're in idle mode, you, there are many situations where you better do this to halt, as opposed to running slowly for the entire time. And, and we have seen that in practice as well as you can work it out on different examples. Just put the numbers in. Uh, the MTV operating point is not a single point. Not a single operating point. Not a single voltage or frequency point. Important to remember. I'm showing you the, the same curve, energy versus VCC frequency here on the y-axis, axis and VCC is frequency in this case. For three different process queues. One is slow for process, fast process, and typical process. So the slower process has the best energy efficiency in terms of identity point. It's 18% lower than the typical or fast process. But it's also 30% slower in F max, a maximum frequency. Okay, so now how do you choose your process? Because on one hand, you can get better energy efficiency for NTV by choosing a slower process, but you compromise on the high frequency part. And sometimes, you know, uh, you have to make the trade off very carefully. So you have to trade off uh, the impact on energy efficiency at the NTV point and the impact on performance. For example, if you're going to achieve a particular throughput, uh, if you use the slow process, you have to have a lot more units in parallel. So each one is slower. Well, each one has a lower energy, energy consumption. So you have area trade offs here as well. So it's area versus performance versus energy. All these come together. And include the process targeting, and you have to do that carefully. Uh, it's a leakage of, of a transistor is turned off. So it's got subsurface leakage, and it's got junction leakage. Uh, those are the main components. It used to have some gate oxide leakage in the past, but in high chemical state, that's gone away. So it's mostly subsurface leakage, that's the one that dominates. But you can also have junction leakage when the subsurface leakage is very small for ultra low leakage devices. It's a combination of those two. So when the transistor is turned off, there's still a current from supply to ground to the off transistors. So the combination of substrate and junction. Yeah, it was actually created five years ago. It's only nine meters. Yes, but ten years ago. I can't get your point. Okay. No, well, using the same technology, we're doing this trade-off, targeting the leakage and the performance. But, yeah, every technology, for every design, you have to make these right choices. So there's no universal choice, you know, that, that's the point. That process targeting is, you know, even in the same technology, you know, it's targeting the process is still important, not just designing something in whatever process is available to get the best out of it, right? So that's the point. You have to do it carefully for every, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the second thing is that uh, within the entire die variation. So if you have identical cores on the same die or identical units, they'll have different NTV points. Same design, same process, same because within the variation, the leakage changes, right? Uh, so you have to map your workload to the scores because they're not not all the same. You can take the worst case and use it, but that's not intelligent. That's not smart, right? So the core mapping, binning. The same thing happens die to die. The NTV operating point changes from die to die because of high volume manufacturing variation. So you have to take all those into account in the testing and the binning and the mapping of the workloads on a die basis to account, you know, to account for the best usage of this NTV in the wide range. <coughs> and, uh, so that's, that's a static variation. Now, now runtime. At runtime, your activity factor changes depending on what you're running. At runtime, your temperature changes. And all of the, both of those things shift your into the operating point dynamically during runtime. So it's a balance of leakage and switching, right? Any, any time it comes into imbalance because the temperature change means higher leakage, higher temperature, activity low means lower dynamic power, balance changes. 
to shift around at one time. So you have to have control during run time to sense where am I? Why is my NCB operating point? Or some time scale and to best utilize the security according to that. Next thing, anything that's idle and leaking or not contributing is leakage power. It's going to shift your NCB operating point. So in any so to really make leakage power as small as possible, you need to shut down idle blocks. Because anytime your idle blocks that are not shut down, will shift the NTP point to the right and what? Higher. So it's extremely important to have fine grain power management at a block level to really make sure your your NTP operating point is not dictated by, you know, that fact that you have too much background leakage that there's something sitting idle and not contributing to leakage. And if by well you could have shut it down. So things like that, you have a question? No, sorry. Uh, so things like, yes, so periodically aging will change negative characteristics, performance characteristics. Anything that changes transistor behavior, in a sense, will impact your NTV point in one way or another, to large or small degree. And you have to be aware of those and, and have mechanisms in place to deal with those and, you know, make sure you're still getting the best operating efficiency. And finally, note that, yes. So for a complex design, uh, this is, no, if it's a simple design, one core frequency is the only thing that's simple binning, right? Yes, you have to have much more complex multivariate binning criteria for designing, for design that are like this. That are going to be used in a platform in a way that is, you know, not just straightforward to find a voltage, a particular frequency and voltage. So yes, yeah, binning is extremely important. The criteria are how to test it in a way that's efficient, you can't spend too much time testing. So all of those things have to come together to so really have a product that fully utilizes in high volume manufacturing an NTV capable design. So that's the point. It's not simple, simple as designing the thing. There's a lot of stuff after the design that needs to happen to really fully, you know, fully take advantage of it. Uh, so finally, you know, if you look at this design, we over-designed it. This thing works until 280 millivolts, right, this you see. And the NTV point is 0.45. We were at plus minus 50 millivolts. Right, with all these variations. So, we didn't have to design for 280 mV operators. We never operate this thing at 280 millivolts. Uh, right? Because that's the suboptimal point. You operate the NTV and shut down. You'll never go to that lower voltage for this design. But we paid all the overheads in terms of making it functional at 280 millivolts, which is not a good thing. Good thing is not a product. It's a, <laughs> a program in a research lab. But in real designs, so you have to make sure you're not over designing. You have a good idea of where your NTV operating range will be in actual usage, what the silicon taxes will be, what your process targeting will be, so that you design for appropriate. It is a little bit lower than the NTV range. Not that much lower because that's the unnecessary over it. Uh, so, you know, so all of that has to come together to really design something that, you know, that's compelling and fully useful for, for uh, NTV. Yeah. This one, uh, just three different skews of the same process. So, so it was, I mean, it's not extremely low level, but you have different transistor linkages. Uh, but, and, and the skew, but the, what I showed you are the different skews. So all the transistors are, are shifting back and forth, and yet there are multiple transistor types in a particular skew. So I'm going to shift gear to go to the dynamic variation. So I talked about static process variations, NTV, all of that. Uh, we pay a lot, or leave a lot on the table in terms of efficiency and performance due to margins. We call it guard bands or margins. So four kinds of margins we typically deal with. And these are dynamic margins. So one is supply voltage. So the supply noise, the IR drop, these load line changes, variations across multiple parts. So we account for all of that thing, okay, so a voltage is a little bit higher, this much higher than the actual operating voltage so that in the presence of all of these variations, I'm still okay. So that's the voltage margin and corresponding frequency margin for voltage variations. There's temperature variation. It's okay. 120 degrees to minus 40, uh, you know, we need to margin for all the extreme cases and all the way not operating under those conditions all the time. So there's a temperature margin that takes away from voltage and frequency. There's the aging margin, like Ali was talking about, that uh, things degrade over time because there's a stress. Transistors degrade, interconnects degrade uh, over the lifetime, seven years, ten years, due to stress conditions, voltage, temperature, stress conditions. And uh, so we margin for that. 
when we end the flight, we still need to be functional, so we say use a you know, higher voltage now, so that by the time you hit 10 years, you will still be okay. Uh, in the lower frequency now, so that in, the, in the beginning of flight itself. So by doing that, you not only are we you know, in the beginning of flight and things are not needed, we're paying extra penalty for frequency or energy, but we're also not able to take advantage of the fact that each chip is degraded differently depending on usage. So we are saying, okay, 100 million chips take the worst degradation possible. Build all of that margin for each chip. Although they are all going to be degraded in the same way, depending on the usage, depending on what voltage and the stress they go through. So, so we are, you know, losing on both sides by using that margin. Then you have path activity margin, meaning that a critical path is not going to be activated every cycle. You're not going to have a delay point every cycle because there's no critical path activation for every walker for every cycle. You're not going to have this delay push out due to multiple input transistors switching for a complex gate simultaneously to push out delay. That's not going to happen every cycle. You're not going to have a signal coupling from neighboring lines every cycle to cause a delay push out every cycle. So all of these things are going to happen in the worst case, astrologically worst case, but we don't know when. So we margin that. We say, okay, assume all of this is going to happen every cycle and margin the voltage frequency. And all of them add up. Especially when you're pushing against getting better performance efficiency and it's easy to get, these margins become extremely important to deal with so that you can push to the next level. So, uh, things we can do. Yeah. Depend on how good you are in adding. Okay, the stupidest thing is just add them up. That's pretty bad, right? You end up with really bad numbers. But there are more sophisticated ways of adding. You take an RMS. Okay. Assume they are random, which is not really the case. But assume they are random, it's better than adding them up as arithmetically. Then you can do more sophisticated. But it's a game of, you know, this versus reward and, you know, how much. You know, it's like a, there's no science behind that per se, right? It's like, okay, you're sort of making assumptions, trying to figure out, okay, how can I get by with minimal margin? But that's how you push first. I cannot give you numbers, unfortunately. <laughs> From my experience, I cannot give you numbers, but I'm sure people in the audience have, you know, we deal with that. And it's a significant, let me put it that way. So significant, it depends on the process, depends on the product, all of that. But, but it is significant. And it's, I mean, in the very beginning, when you had a lot of facts, you say, okay, just add them up. You know, we have enough margin. I mean, you don't care about pushing that. Uh, but then you say, oh, that's, that's really bad. I mean, you can't just add them up. Nothing will ever work. So then you say, you know, methodology improvement, all of that. But eventually, Binning doesn't help you here. Binning is a process variation solution, right? It doesn't help you for the dynamic uh, variation. So for dynamic variations, essentially what you're doing is that you're taking these margins, assuming this worst case situation would happen all the time, and just, you know, designing, setting the voltage frequency based on that. You're leaving a lot of it on the table, and in fact, they don't happen all the time with all these worst cases together. So, you know, so that's sort of the thing you need to mitigate. So adaptation and configuration can help you that. So you can have sensors on die uh, where you have temperature sensors, voltage group sensors, you can have current sensors, supply current sensors for power and activity monitoring, you can have aging sensors to look at degradation over time. And the sensor can feed into control units which decides based on the current condition what the right voltage frequency it can use. Right? Uh, so if the temperature changes, uh, you know, uh, goes down, it can speed up, it can lower the voltage as long as the temperature is low and so on, right? So you can do all of that. If the workload changes, you can reconfigure the units for doing the you know, new workload, the new operations more optimally, like you know, changing bit position, for example, or changing the bit width, for example. So there are many things you can do by monitoring uh, what's going on both in the environment as well as workload, and constantly adapting and reconfiguring to make sure you're always at the optimal point at that, under that situation. So it's a self-aware, responding to variations on the fly, to make sure you don't put any you know, major margins in all of these. So that's one way to deal with it. And there's an example of uh, a TC to IP processor where you have voltage group sensor and thermal sensor on die. Uh, when a group happens, supply group happens, it detects in the supply group, immediately slows down the clock. And when the group goes away, it knows that and brings the clock back up. So the group happens very infrequently. By doing this, your average performance is pretty good, as opposed to sitting at the low frequency assuming there's a group all the time. So you really get a significant benefit in performance and efficiency by responding to this rare or infrequent event uh, on the fly, uh, as opposed to margining for them. 
You can do the same thing with temperature. You can do the same thing by aging. You can monitor the aging regression over periodically, over you know, hours or days or months, and then adjust the frequency uh, as the thing decreases, as opposed to saying uh, low frequency to begin with. So uh, it's possible to do many of these things uh, in actual designs. Now you can go beyond that. You can respond to slow variations by adapting. Because you see that's happening, it's going to be there for a while, you can adapt, the response has to never adapt before something bad happens. But if you want to push your voltage frequency even further into the domain of you cannot detect and adapt in time, you're going to have errors. You're going to have timing errors. Right? Now, uh, nobody has said errors are unacceptable unless the user suffers from it. So if you have, can have errors in your system and it doesn't impact the final behavior of the system in a major way that the user actually knows that happened, meaning that you recovered from it before anything bad happened, then that's okay, right? And that's perfectly acceptable. So you can push now using resiliency or error detection features, uh, both voltage and frequency, beyond the adaptation uh, limit. So if you have error detection capability for diagnosis, confinement capability, you can have you know, system error correction, system recovery capability built in. You can have adaptation, reconfiguration, all built in together. They can deal with errors without, under the hood, without anybody knowing about it or anybody suffering from it, right? And you can implement this across your layer of hardware and software. You can implement some of these microarchitecture level, circuit level, uh, micro code, firmware, uh, different layers of system software like OS and VM. Even uh, application and programming systems can guide you in terms of now, how to track these errors, how to understand them and adapt and configure uh, as they happen. So, so this resilient platform can help you really push the limits further than what adaptation and reconfiguration can do with themselves. You can combine the two and then take it further. Now, where you implement these things in hardware and software is a, is a very careful consideration we have to take. For example, if you implement something in circuit level or microarchitecture level, you can get fine granularity, fast response. Because it's in hardware, silicon. But you have a silicon overhead for doing that. As you go up the stack from circuit to architecture to software layers, the effective error rate actually goes down. Because every bit that flips in the cache does not really impact program execution. The program may never use that bit. So the effective error rate gets masked as you go higher and higher level. So at a higher level, if you implement a mechanism for error tracking or recovery, you have a much large, larger time to respond to it because you won't have very few errors at that level compared to what's happening actually in the silicon. So not all errors demonstrate themselves in actual behavior problems in the system. So, so you have to carefully choose the optimal implementations of these features across the hardware and software layers to make sure that you know, they get the performance and power benefit you're shooting for and while providing the resiliency uh, that, that you need in this platform. Example of that, and this is based on the Razor work that many of you must have uh, heard that uh, you know, the Michigan uh, pioneered a while back. So this is open spark core where you have seven pipeline stages in the execution path, and uh, you have error detection sequentials embedded in the flip flops. They essentially double sampling flip flops. You sample the incoming critical path signal twice, once at the target frequency, once a little later, and if they're different, then there's a timing error. Uh, you can do pre-sampling. You can sample a delayed version of the path to see if it's within the margin of the frequency. And there's a tunable replica circuit. Sometimes it's very complex to have every flop have this detection capability to double sampling. So you have a tunable replica circuit that mimics the critical path behavior, and you double sample that uh, to detect errors. You can't detect uh, path activation kind of variations in that case, but you can detect uh, the global variations like supply noise and temperature changes by doing that. And then you have adaptive clock control. You can change the clock as you detect errors. You have instruction replay. You detect an error in the pipeline, timing error. You flush the pipeline, replay the instruction at a different frequency, slower frequency to run it correctly. Then you move on. So, and there's the error uh, recovery overhead monitor also in this chip, which says, okay, how much, you know, how many errors are happening? Uh, how much overhead I'm paying by replaying and doing all of these things? If it's too much overhead, then I'm not really winning. The error rates are too high. So I need to go to a slower frequency to bring the error rate down until it falls below the you know, recovery threshold. So the monitors like that, which can take actions based on the error behavior profile, make sure you're not you know, constantly recovering from errors while running stuff. Uh, 
and just come to a standstill. So with this chip, uh, we ran a, a program. It's called Edge Detect. It's the input image. Uh, the program detects the edge of the image. So when you run with the resiliency on, this error detection correction feature is on, you get a clean image, edge detection. When you turn it off, you can see that the image is pretty corrupted, so, which means a lot of errors are happening under the hood. But when the resiliency features are on, it's taking care of all of those in a way that, you know, still performs the job at a reasonable performance and efficiency without the errors being visible to the user or corrupting program output. Now, if you look at the comparison of energy versus um, performance throughput for this kind of system, you can find that you can leverage this kind of capability to push voltage and frequency and get better energy or flash performance, a better throughput. Now, for a bunch of programs, we saw significant gains in energy and performance by having these features for this open spark uh, processor. I'll talk a little bit about voltage regulators because, as you have seen, uh, we have multiple voltage domains, time grain power management, platform control, and how to do all that uh, is difficult if you have a, just one board, big VR sitting on the board, supplying supply the whole chip. You need to have a way of, uh, you have to worry about the efficiency of the power conversion from wherever the power is coming from, it's 12 volts or 5 volts to your MPV voltage or your nominal voltage and time. So that power conversion efficiency is extremely important and the size and the uh, impact of that and power supply noise and so on. So, Integrated voltage regulator, when you put the voltage regulator, the last stage of the regulator, on die, is a good way of uh, creating uh, power uh, voltage regulator capability that's uh, power and area efficient. Uh, by having more small passives close to the die, you can operate at higher frequency, and you get good area efficiency. You can scale the form factor better, as opposed to having big inductors and capacitors with the off die power supply. Um, it's, uh, you can preserve you know, different scalability of of this thing moving from one platform to another. You just change the VR on die with everything else in any of the thing. So distributing the power to the platform, uh, the best way to do it is distributed low current to minimize losses and minimize supply noises in the distribution network, and then convert from low current to high current at the point of consumption, which is on the die. That way you get the best of, you know, that's how power distribution is ideally work. So by having it on die, you are minimizing all the distribution losses and minimizing all the noises and Reducing the passive unit and the board and the power delivery network off time. Then you need control of the power, power voltage domain, meaning that you need to have a fine grain, to have individual IP blocks or a bunch of IP blocks that are pretty small in size, have their own voltage domain, generated, distributed, converted from whatever supply is coming from. You need to change the voltage fast and efficiently for all the adaptation mechanisms to be in place for a lot of power management, DGFS, things to happen at a fine grain. So having integrated voltage regulator allows you to do that much easier than having an off-die uh, voltage regulator. And then, of course, you're operating across a wide range of voltages and currents, and the efficiency is important. The conversion efficiency is important across the entire range, not just your max power point, because the entire range from light load to heavy load. So you have to have a flat efficiency curve for the VR across this order of energy change in load current and several hundred millivolts change in supply voltage at the output. To do that, you have to consider the VR on the fly, you know, can, at the low, low current range, you can shape phases because you don't need, uh, don't have too much of output triple to worry about your switching and, you know, DC loss is dominated at low current for efficiency loss. So, shedding phases are good, you know, shutting down stuff is good. And at the high current, max current, you care about supply noise, which is the highest, triples, which are the highest, and conduction loss is dominant. So, you have to consider the VR for mitigating those at high current. But having this considerable VR that automatically senses the current and voltage uh, ranges and configures itself for the best flat efficiency across the range is, is something that we have to do more and more. An example of a fully integrated VR, uh, it's an Intel product for several years now. Uh, you have four cores, the graphics engine, uh, uh, the ring NOC on die, and the system agent. They all have the independent power supplies, independent voltage domains on die with on die uh, integrated switch bug VRs. The inductors are in the package layer. They're not on package, inside the layers of the package. They go around the core in the package, the air core inductors inside the package. Each core has a its inductor sitting underneath inside the package. Uh, and then uh, so this you control of at a core level, IP block level, to deliver and, and manage power. And you can see that you get a pretty flat efficiency curve across uh, you know, one amp to 16 amps 
such as VR, because it's for 16 phases to minimize ripple at high current. But then as you go to lower current, you shed the phases, shut down phases, in the 16 to 12, and your efficiency becomes flat. You can take a pretty flat curve across this large range of currents. We have to cover going beyond the SOC that other parts of the platform that are important. One is uh, interconnect. Clearly, data movement is a key part of any platform. Uh, electrical has been the workhorse for short distances. Um, higher data rate is critical. The channels are lossy. Distance are getting longer. So deal with all of that by optimizing the you know, many techniques for the not only for the transceivers, uh, the wireless I/O techniques, but also the channels. You have people creating better, uh, less discontinuities, um, better uh, channel loss characteristics, flex tables, and so on, for supporting higher data rates with lower energy uh, across shorter distances. And then if you go to long distances, you have to worry, you know, electrical is no longer good enough, it's beyond a few meters, it's hard to get the efficiency and performance at very high data rates for electrical. So optical actually wins out for the longer distances because less interferences, less channel losses over longer distances. Uh, but the main challenge is you know, integration of the optical components, especially the laser, in a way that's close to the point of usage, and it has good reliability, low cost, all those challenges are being addressed in the, in the industry and the community. And also have to worry about the, the latency and the energy overhead of converting from electrical to optical and back, from transmit to receive. So that there's an overhead there that you have to make sure it doesn't dominate uh, your, your energy and performance uh, considerations. Memory. Uh, so we talked about logic, we talked about interconnects, but then you have to worry about the storage and the memory, the DRAM. Uh, because you're putting so much more compute every time on the same die with Moore's law, the memory bandwidth to scale with that. Otherwise, you can't feed the compute engine at the, at the rate you need to. So if you have a DDR for your memory interface to the SOC, you know, at two watts limit for DDR, you can saturate at 10 gigabits per second. It is not nearly good enough for uh, a large many core uh, system today. So we need to have new technologies come into play for the memory interface to provide sufficient bandwidth and sufficient bandwidth density at a sufficiently high energy efficiency between the memory and the compute. And 3D stacking has been around for a while as a technology and it's getting more traction in some segments these days. That provides you a way of getting very high density connections between two chips, in the memory and the logic chip, with where each connection can operate at very low voltage, low frequency to get still get a high aggregate bandwidth. So there's so many of them at high density. Plus you're traveling over a very short distance from one day to the other. The three just stacked on top of each other using two silicon VRs. So the interface is very simple, the transceivers are very simple. Uh, so all of that uh, makes this pretty attractive as you know, going beyond DDR evolution. Uh, to go to the next level of uh, memory interface to the to the processor. Okay, so I have uh, 10 minutes, which I'm going to go through pretty quickly. I don't have any data in the next part of the presentation. I just have, uh, uh, I'll call it quantification. <laughs> or, <laughs> uh, I just want to just talk about what's possible here. So the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is, you know, what you need to explore for, uh, you know, building really truly intelligent and autonomous systems that are both efficient and scalable. And uh, the best way we feel is that to approach that is building a neuromorphic system, which essentially means you try to exploit the essential structural and functional features of the direction to understand how a brain works and utilize that to get extreme energy efficiency for a set of cognition workloads. So it's important to have cognition workloads. Extreme energy efficiency is the key thing, and you do two intelligence kind of systems, autonomous systems as opposed to computing systems. So with that in mind, you know, uh, if you look at the bottleneck of a standard computing system, the fundamental architecture, it's a memory bottleneck. We just talked about it, memory bandwidth. Because memory and logic technology from day one of technology, compute technology, are extremely different. They've always been different. They've never been able to integrate a memory, a true high density memory technology with logic on the same time. Never been possible. As a result of that, the memory and logic are separate dies with a bus in between that can support the transfer. And that's the bottleneck we're running into as we evolve the standard computing architecture. Now, if you look at the brain, 
least I'm not a neuroscientist, but at, at a high level, like an engineer, if you look at the brain. It's got the memory and the logic uh, fully intermingled. The synapses are next to the neurons, and each synaptic connection is one way to store its memory. So memory and logic are fully distributed to the finest possible brain, at the gate level, if you want to think about it that. There's no difference. There's no memory part of the brain and logic part of the brain. So that's one thing. So, you know, so we need to go beyond this memory bottleneck that limits efficiency for cognition and machine learning for anything you think of, for any computing system. So that's one part. The other part is that uh, traditional computing systems are based on development of algorithms that solve a problem, and you program the algorithm, and you run it on the computer, and it solves it. Uh, you can only solve the problem that you know you have an algorithm for, and that you can write a code for, and then it's going to do it. The brain is not programmed to do anything. In fact, it won't do nothing. It just figures out what to do when it needs to do it, and how to do it. So it's based on learning. So once you have the neuromorphic system, it's based on uh, training and continuous learning, and the learning happens through brain, body, environment interaction. Just uh, that's the IOE system I talked about. You're getting sensory data, processing it, learning the you know, context, this context, taking a decision, what decision it takes, action it takes, changes the data it comes in, and that goes on continuously. And it evolves in, uh, in its behavior autonomously, continuously, in a way that nobody programmed it for. Right. So that's the fundamental two differences between neuromorphic system and a standard computing system. And both are important for I think the next leap in architecture and and the realization of the things kind of things we need to do for IOE. So what are the features of this kind of a system? If you look at from, as an engineer to, into your brain, it's got special temporal encoding. It's based the uh, information is transmitted with a spike timing, not based on binary values. It's got a very complex and efficient network of connectivity, the neurons and synapses. That, that is dynamic. It changes on the fly. It's not static. Okay? It's, it's asynchronous. It's event-driven. Most of the time, nothing is happening in the brain. Not much is going on. It's all, all asynchronous, event-driven. It's, uh, it's based on continuous learning, and that's driven by synaptic plasticity, which is synaptic, the synaptic rate change over time in a way that creates the learning. Uh, and it creates homeostasis, meaning that, you know, it makes sure it's always, always in a power efficient state. It doesn't go haywire, it doesn't go, go to sleep, you know, completely idle. Homeostasis is very important to preserve its activity and being alive and, and continuous, continuously learning uh, based on interactions. It's got uh, stochasticity. So neurons and synapses behave stochastically. They're not deterministic. They, sometimes they fire, sometimes they don't, or quite randomly. And uh, the data that comes in and gets processed also is stochastic. Uh, it's, 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 it's a mix of noise. And that creates some optimization and, and capabilities, the efficiency capabilities that you can't find in deterministic systems. And it's recurrent and adaptive and resilient. So all of these features are somewhat, are completely different from what you find in any computing system we build. So there is like the key to explore how we can leverage this to, uh, to do what we want to do here, which is build this extremely efficient cognition system, intelligent system, autonomous system that the standard computing may not allow you to do to that level. And it exists in proof of this system in nature. Here you all, we all have one. Uh, first is that it's very slow. Each neuron operates a kilohertz or even slower. It's very slow. And but the whole lot of them, the 80 billion neurons in the brain. It's a very large aggregate of things. It's very slow, which accomplishes very sophisticated things. Extremely efficient because they're all slow. Each one is slow, right? That's the first thing. It's very dark. I mean, most of the time, nothing happens. Very sparse activity. Nothing much goes on most of the time. Meaning that that's the key to energy efficiency. If you have high activity all the time, then you're probably wasting energy, right, for something. So it's extremely uh, efficient in that way, very sparse in terms of activity. Uh, it's scalable, and that's a unique, it's an accelerator. It's a universal engine. So if you look at the brain of a round one, C. elegans, it's got 300 neurons. Human brain has 80 billion neurons. Everything in between has numbers in between. 
they're all the same architecture. They're all the same neurons, same synapses, same way constructed, there's no difference. So they all do different things, they all have different capabilities, correct? So it's scalable. I can employ the right number of neurons, the right number of synapses in a, you know, this platform here for some capability. I just make more of them, deploy in a bigger platform for bigger capability. This very nicely scalable. So I have to build a point accelerator for each one of the functions. Uh, so these are the, and it's universal and all of that, right? So that's sort of the feature we want in this kind of system in the future. We're not going to, you know, push accelerators to get to where we need to go. So let's talk about one of the coding uh, things it has. So spike timing and coding. What is that? You have time slots in a particular window, and depending on where the spike happens, it conveys information, codifies information. So that's much more efficient than spike rate encoding, energy efficient, because for spike rate, you have to have multiple spikes to, to indicate what information it is, what value it is. So for single spike, which is the transition consequences energy, create, and, but where it fires, which time slot create, no, under the information, it's extremely efficient energy-wise. Uh, other good thing about that is spike rate, you have to measure the spike rate of a multiple time slots, is okay, five spikes, ten spikes, so you have to wait for the spiking to finish to know what it means. Here you just wait, and as soon as the time slot you, it fires, you know what it means. So you just start going to the time slot, right? So immediately as the information is conveyed, it's, it's consumable. So it's efficient in that way. It's more area efficient than spatial encoding across multiple neurons. So if a neuron, if you want to do the same thing across multiple neurons, depending on which neuron fires, you say, okay, what's the information? Here, which time slot a neuron fires in terms of information. So a single neuron can do a lot more conveying of information than when you're doing a, you know, without time slots you know, across multiple neurons. There's more area efficient. So what limits how fast you can pull this? And why can't we do it today in standard systems? Because to do this, you need extreme temporal precision. Especially if you run things at 1 gigahertz or 10 gigahertz. You have to divide, you know, take the time slot, divide it up. Now, if you have real-time systems, the brain response is hundreds of milliseconds versus hundreds of nanoseconds, then you have enough time to create the time slot windows. So that's, so being slow actually is a perfect way of doing this because you have good signal to noise ratio with really wide time slots where you can encode information. So having temporal precision limits how far, how much you can do it. And so, you know, so, but being slow, being slower performance per neuron facilitates this kind of coding. So we need to leverage those kind of characteristics to build systems that can, you know, take the efficiency uh, promised by this kind of uh, coding techniques. Now, what are the capacity? So if you take a, uh, it's got a, it's got the highest capacity per neuron. If you have a single neuron just spiking or not, that's a capacity of uh, log of two, right? But here you can have a large time window per neuron. You can try to them in as many as you want, given limited by temporal precision, and log of that is your capacity. And there's no, lim no limited capacity in that sense if you're willing to slow down or if you have better temporal precision for your building blocks. You can scale the capacity up and down pretty nicely by using uh, techniques uh, that are, you know, for various intolerant design, for better temporal precision, trading of performance versus capacity, and all of these things. So it's highest per neuron capacity and can scale that very nicely using all these other knobs. So to really build a neural synaptic network with high capacity, you want to leverage Moore's law, which means have a lot of neurons. 80 billion is way, way out of reach even today. You need to have a lot of neurons, a lot of synapses. And you want to scale the information capacity by having this slow operation where you have large time windows, good enough to match the real time requirement, not going to be arbitrarily slow. But that requirement is much slower than what you have for computing systems, but there's an opportunity there for really um, taking this and exploiting it. Why is sparsity important? We code everything today dense as possible code. The binary coding is dense as code, right? Because you want high capacity. You can't afford enough elements. You have to code the highest density code to represent information. That's what kind of computing systems do. But then when you want to read out the information, it's more or less efficient because you have to have a complex decoding to read out what you coded. You have a sparse coding where you know, one thing represents just you know few things, then decoding is really easy. So read out decisions are much higher if you have sparsity. You don't need to go through a complex decoding process 
to understand what information that is contained in there. And the brain uses sparsity to have very high readout efficiency. So it exploits a lot of neurons and there's time encoding, which can scale up and down in terms of capacity, to get the sufficient capacity that it needs. But the readout is very good because very efficient because it's very everything is very sparsely represented. And that's an important feature that we need to exploit for building this kind of systems. We could quickly go through the uh, five minutes. Not, not so questions for the in between, so I'm okay with that, right? So uh, we can uh, uh, the neuron models are you know, there's a variety of them. Uh, there's very simple ones: the leaping integrated fire, where you have essentially a spike current coming in, getting integrated on the membrane, membrane potential changes as it goes up, crosses the threshold, the neuron fires. When there's no spike coming in between, there's a leakage at the membrane where current goes away and the potential slowly decays until the next one comes. So that's a leaking integrated fire neuron model that has been that everybody has explored for all sorts of exploration and implementations of this kind of system. So that's the simplest one. The most complex one and most biologically a high fidelity one that mimics what you understand from biology is the Hodgkin Husky model back in the 50s. Uh, they came up with that. Which has, uh, in addition to the conductance that's just for uh, leakage, they also have a conductance for ion channel and potassium channel. And these conductances are uh, nonlinearly dependent on the membrane potential. So they have, you have lot more nonlinearity in that model. And it can uh, mimic or recreate 20 very complex firing patterns that a simple LIS model will not be able to recreate. So using the Hodgkin Husky model. And it's very, very, uh, uh, it's got a, you know, it limits the biological behavior that the observer in my mouth is quite reliably uh, than a simple S model. So we need to decide what kind of model we want. So clearly, uh, since we're operating very slowly, we can time multiplex a neuron, a physical neuron. If you have one physical neuron, you can time multiplex 100 times to create 100 virtual neurons because you have 100 milliseconds to process something, right? Which means that, um, each neuron can be functionally pretty complex. You don't have to go for the simplest neuron. Because we can have a complex physical neuron, but you time multiplex that to create all the virtual neurons you need. But you need to make sure when you do that, everything else in the neural network balances nicely. You can't have like, you know, the weights and the synaptic findings and all of those need to be matching well balanced with the neuron model choice. Otherwise you're not going to be leveraging the neuron model. And then the question I have is the neutral implementation. The usual implementation of neurons is very simple. It's an adder, accumulator, and a threshold comparator. Quite simple. It's scalable, process scalable, synthesizable. It's pretty robust against variations and noises. It's easily configurable, reconfigurable for parameters. High integration density possible. Lots of integration very friendly for that. Validation is easier. The analog CMOS uh, neuron, and many have tried that, has a disparate integrator the input, the spike current gets integrated into a capacitor. The capacitor feeds uh, inverting amplifier with a positive feedback uh, to create uh, spiking in the threshold is crossed of the capacitor voltage. And it's extremely energy efficient. So it's about 1,000 dex better energy for operation than analog one compared to digital one. But it's not scalable. You can't implement that in a, in a scale process. It's not integration friendly, meaning they can't have a million of them or a billion of them on a die. It's not good for you know, instructive design. It's not synthesizable. It's got limited voltage scaling. It's more prone to noises and radiations. So if you want to implement a few neurons that's at the edge of IoT, and a millimeter scale platform, just you know, 100 neurons with synapses, analog is probably a good answer in the older process. But you're going to create a neuron, uh, neuron synapse that sort of scales from a, you know, sort of a, a million to a few billion on a die, you have to go to Egypt. You can, can never get any analog work at that scale of integration. Right? So, but we have to make these choices quite, uh, quite effectively. One of the features of this network is learning. And how does learning happen? The two kinds of plasticity that causes learning to happen. One is synaptic plasticity, one is structural plasticity. So, weight of a synapse can change based on spike timing behavior across the synapse. So, it's called potentiation. For some spike timing cases, the weight becomes stronger, the synapse becomes stronger. For some spike timing cases, it becomes weaker. So that's one mechanism, they call it reweighting, that happens in the brain. The second one is structural, reconnection. A synapse can uh, form or go away, or get pruned, based on, again, spike timing behavior and other, other rules. It's rewiring on an axonal branch of a neuron 
uh, a new branch can form or get buried. There's regeneration. The neurons can be generated or removed based on, again, spiking behavior dynamics of the network. There's reparameterization. The delay of a spike along an axon can be modulated based on spike timing behavior of the network. So there are all these structural and synaptic plasticities are key to this local and distributed learning mechanisms that, that make the network learn to arbitrate, in, when exposed to arbitrary things. Let you see there are not utilized those. Many learning modes. You can utilize the same rules to create different types of learning. There's unsupervised learning, the pattern detection. In figure of the pattern, detect patterns without telling how many times there's a pattern in there. There's self-supervised learning. It associates a couple of things that are disconnected, like audio-visual things. There's audio stream, there's a visual stream. It creates association between those two automatically based on learning. It's called self-supervised learning, association of patterns. Supervised learning, we all know about deep learning. You have labeled data sets, you train, it learns to recognize something from data sets. So that, you can do that here as well. The most complex one is reinforcement learning. And that's key for decision making. So what, what, what happens there is that there are triggers of punishments and rewards that flow through the network, superimposed on the spike timing dynamics, to create behavior that leads to decisions. What is a good decision or it's a bad decision? What to do or what not to do? So that's like extremely sophisticated learning. It's called reinforcement. You reinforce the behavior or reinforce, you know, take away a bad behavior. Uh, and that learning is really the most complex one. And, and it's all achieved in the brain by this simple plasticity mechanism and, and brain-body environment interaction to, uh, to really create, you know, this decision-making capability, which you really need in an autonomous system. You need to make the right decision is learn on the fly under changing conditions. I'm not going to the plasticity uh, rules here. There are several you know, spike timing given plasticity that modulate weight based on the spike arrival time at the before and after the synapse. The short term plasticity that um, uh, creates a negative feedback mechanism to create stability and homeostasis in the network. Let me talk a little bit about in you know, a couple of minutes I have the network. Extremely important. So neurons are pretty simple. The synapses are pretty straightforward, data update and learning rules. Now, what we find in the brain, the fanning per neuron can be 10,000. So I said in NT we don't use more than two fanning gates, right? So 10,000 fanning per neuron. I mean, there's no internet technology in the world that will support 10,000 fanning for a billion neurons on a chip per neuron. It's extreme, but it's hierarchical. So it's got High local connectivity, local density of connection, but sparse global connectivity. Okay. So it's a hierarchical, but extremely dense, high signing connections locally, sparse global connections. The other part of it is amazing. Uh, it's, it's called the small world network, meaning that if you take two nodes of that network and add another, you know, if you just have n nodes in the network, and then you add another node, the average distance between two randomly selected nodes on that network scales very weakly as log of n. It is an extremely important property. So it doesn't matter how many nodes you work, add, the average is between two randomly selected nodes. That's important, not the worst case node. It goes grows very weakly as you add more and more nodes. So in the brain, you can go globally across from any point to any point in the brain randomly in three hops, roughly. Also, they have 80 billion neurons. So that's a small world network property that people have studied for other applications. That we need to sort of figure out how to utilize here to create this complex and rich connectivity that's key to make this neural network behave and learn in the way you want to. So there are crossbar, you know, mesh connections, NLCs, uh, asynchronous AER. They have their own pros and cons, but I mean, if you're exploring, you know, area to explore, there's a lot of work to do here to figure out what's the right choice for it's efficient, scalable networks with dynamic connectivity that we need, and that's sparsity in there. Finally, you have to have memory fully distributed. And physically, it's hard to do. Uh, people are exploring using SRAMs, the amount you can do. Clearly, 3D stacking can help bring best memory technology in a way that you can find and distribute. But that's the key thing, because most of this chip is memory. The neurons can time multiplex. Connectivity can time multiplex. The weight values for synapse. You have to store. There's no getting away from that. If you physically store, 
each bit of the weight. You can't have what your weight value stored, right? So, so most of the people that build the chip, 90% of the chip is memory. It's RAM in this case. Most of the active power, because everything is very sparse, very slow, 90% of the active power is leakage, memory leakage. So clearly having high density, non-volatile, finely distributed, local memory is extremely critical for building this kind of system. And taking advantage of the slowness and other features to really, you know, make sure that can happen. So that's a big challenge that we all need to address. So clearly we need major work in architecture design, technologies, emerging, included, and CMOS to make it all come together and try building this kind of intelligent autonomous system that is inspired, not inspired, but the, the structured, functionally, uh, and functionally behaving like a, like a brain architecture. So with that, I think, uh, you know, we have a long way to go for an exponent. We're at the beginning of it. And uh, there's a lot of work to do and a lot of possibilities in going forward. So with that, I'll thank you and maybe a couple of questions. That, you know, let's try to start. Could you please wait for the microphone? Uh, so it's a very excellent presentation. My question is, how do the MDV trade-offs change with FinFET process? You know, you described 32 nanometer. Uh, so FinFET is a lower leakage process, but it's got a cheaper substitution slope. It helps, if anything, because the lower leakage you have, the more better efficiency you can get at the MDV point. So FinFET, anything, you know, lower leakage processes are always uh, helpful for MDV. And then, uh, you know, the uh, DIDP, when you turn off, so for very high power processes, you know, that can become a limiting issue. How do you uh, deal with some of those things? So having the integrated voltage regulator helps with some of that, because you look at the DIDP, there are three groups, you know, first group, second group, third group. You have a fully integrated VR, the first, third and second group go away because you don't see the parasitic of the board. The only thing you have to do is the first group, which is the output of the VR. Uh, that part helps. Uh, and then all the adaptation, adaptation mechanisms, resolution mechanisms help. So you can deal with a group by detecting it, responding to it, even allowing errors to happen and recovery from it without having the margin for the group. So from both sides, you need to attack it. Hi. Uh, my question is if, if a chip had a uh, usage model such that you, can, you are allowed to go to a deep sleep mode, uh, then do you see much benefit of uh, near VT design for the active mode of that chip? Or you're just better off, you know, being active for a short time with, with a regular, let's say, uh, low active power process, and then just go to deep sleep? Yeah, if you can, you can go to deep sleep, but remember that, you, uh, you know, you have to wake up in time. So the reason you cannot go to deep sleep all the time because it takes time to wake up from, you know, it takes longer time to wake up from a deeper sleep than a shallow sleep and then, you know, some active, right? So, all, many times you find that you're not able to go to sleep because you don't know that you can respond in time if you need to wake up. So, so that dictates that you need, you know, the entire range of power states, all the way from deep sleep and everything in between, and different active states, because the amount of things that are running that are so variable and so, so much variety in the workloads that, you know, any situation may arise and you can you have to deal with that. But then, hypothetically, even with the uh, near VT design, if you are at the lowest uh, energy point, and you kind of have to go to a faster point, you would still encounter the same issues of ramping up and down. Yes, and so to go from, uh, you know, to change voltage, uh, uh, you know, if you have off die VR, it's, it's slow, voltage frequency. But if you have on die VR, integrated VR is faster. And the other, the many forms of integrated VR, like LDOs, which can make it really fast. So, but each of them is straight up, meaning that you have to select the right VR and the right power state that aligns with that to change the voltage fast enough to go from one point to another. If it's DBFS, but you can change the, the, the DBFS speed uh, based on what kind of PLL and what kind of VR you have. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'd like to um, follow up on that. Okay. Um, about what kind of order of magnitude time are we talking about for being able to shut down and, and uh, what you call it, reactivation. Uh, if you want to cut down an entire core, for example, on a chip, so if you take, it's the amount of capacitance you have. Especially when you shut down the capacitance of the you know, decoupling cap and all that cap of the logic transistors, you have to discharge. 
and so this is and it is starting to leakage current. So that takes sometimes you know hundreds of cycles, clock cycles. And then you have to be there for a certain time to really make it worthwhile for you to go and shut down. So otherwise you'll be shutting down, waking up, shutting down, waking up, you're not going to save any energy. So to be in the shutdown state for a sufficient time to recover the overage that you pay to discharge and charge the capacitor. And uh, depending on the size of the block, the bigger the size, uh, the less often you can shut it down. Because the overage is higher. You're, you're charging and discharging a bigger capacitor. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. There's no time number of cycles per se, but I'll say for a core, it's hundreds of cycles, block cycles. But for bigger blocks could be more, the smaller blocks could be less. Okay, I'm sorry. I think we have to end it here. We don't have much time. Maybe you could uh, follow up with the speaker offline. Uh, so we'd like to thank our speaker. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending the seminar. And we have a certificate for a speaker at Dr. Day. Let's take a photo for the magazine. Thank you very much. Uh, please check out the website uh, and also we send out the emails for future seminars in the future. Uh, if, uh, if you're interested to be an advisor to the chapter and if you have any recommendations for the speaker or you'd like to be up uh, to volunteer, uh, we need more help. So we'd be happy to have you on the, uh, on the committee. Uh, with that, thank you very much and have a good night. <laughs>